right, welcome back to the 2019 Cannabis Industry Summit. Joining us now is Craig Aronoff. How are you, Craig? I'm wonderful, Kevin. How are you? So tell me what STEM is and why it's important to the people who are here today. Well, what STEM is is the Cannabis Tax Experts of Michigan. What we are is a full service package that provides everything from legal compliance to tax compliance and business cons consulting um, for cannabis companies. And so it, what our firm will do is help them not only get licensed, but once they are licensed, make sure they're being tax compliant in their spending, make sure they're being uh, prov providing the proper sales tax, excise tax as required, uh, making sure that they can survive an audit. So what I'm hearing from people I'm talking to is, do not come into this business and think you can just sort of figure it out or wing it. No. You really need to get the core people in place. That's so true. when people call, what, what are they asking? What are they trying to figure out? And what solutions are you solving for them? So my principal practice, Aronoff Law, is a law firm dedicated to helping companies and individuals get licensed in Michigan. So for the last several years, as you say, and I use the expression, go get your PhD in the industry. Right. And this is part of it. Being at an event like this is learning. You can learn from your peers, learn from others, listen to Director Brisbo and otherwise. Um, but that's the key is we start off learning our trade craft and then applying it. So I've been a business lawyer for over 20 years and then started working in cannabis to layer in that same skill set. So as people call in, we try to figure out first, what are you trying to do? Let's talk about your plans, your strategy, and then let's figure out an implementation plan based upon what your desires are and also what your limitations will be. If you have a limited amount of capital, then let's readjust what we can do. If you have a limited space to do it or a location that's uniquely different, let's talk about how we can help with that. And then from local licensing to state licensing and then operations from there. So do you help in all segments of the industry? Yeah. And so that license is different for everybody, right? It is. I mean, again, it goes to what you want to do. So in the medical market, we have five license types. Um, the grower license being one of them that has three options within it. In the recreational market, we have the same five, but we have an additional three that get added to it. And as a result, it's just a slightly different application process. So we're helping mostly in the medical side now, and we're looking forward to getting our adult use applications going. And not anyone can just get into it, right? There, in some cases, there's limited numbers of people who are going to be allowed to, to, to be in certain areas? Well, a lot of it will be based on the lo local location. If we use, um, say, for instance, the city of Detroit, which many people hear about all these shops and everything, well, the reality is they have a cap of 75 stores. So if you're looking to do a store, Detroit's not going to be a good target for you right now because they're basically used up. So we got to go to locations where there's availability. Um, a lot of the communities that have opted in then put a number on it. From the state's perspective, wherever a community will say yes, the state will license you. Okay. So there's not a limit from the it's state. Kind of like a liquor license, really, it right? Is, you move yeah. into a town and they're like, no, oh, we're, you know, you got to wait for someone to close down before you get a liquor license. <laughs> but only now they're they're kind of open for business because they're setting the numbers they can have. Yeah, right? I think you know, and I think uh, as I've described it before, it's a bit of a, if I can use the expression, the bastard child of a liquor license and a casino license. Okay. Okay. So the casino license on the money and the financials and the deep background check, the liquor license is a license for a specific use um, licensee operator at a specific location locally approved. So we mirror the two together and we have this marijuana application. And are there things people can do in advance of meeting with you to be ready to, to uh, be more likely to be approved? Well, if they got their ducks in a row, that would be helpful. Right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think from our consultation, to be honest, from the initial call, what we do is, is we go back and give uh, basically a homework assignment to our clients or our prospects and say, this is how we can proceed forward. Because until I know their narrative, my advice is limited to the facts I have. So you change a fact, I'll change my advice. Right. And so we really want to kind of dig in and know the, the core of what their plans are and then try to develop a strategy around it. Now, if we're just talking basic licensing, there are some really common elements. We know we need a year's worth of bank statements. We know we need you know, three years of tax returns. We know we're gonna need you know, all of your, to identify all of your real estate. Um, we need to know who all the parties are. Um, what have you set up already? Bring that to me already. So if we can give those type of things, it gives us a head start. But, you know, in the end, I'm still going to give you a homework assignment. Right. You're going to have a checklist. There's Always. going to be a checklist. Yes. And so if you get through the, uh, through the licensing part of it, how does the tax play into it? So, you know, what we have is the evolution of, a, of an operation. And so from the very beginning to go into licensing, we might start off thinking, well, 
I want to be a small grower. Let's set it up as a limited liability company. The LLC is an easy operating agreement. And from there, what we find out is, well, that grower partnered with two other people, and now they want to have a process lab and a larger grow facility and three provisioning centers. Well, an LLC isn't the right entity for that. So what we really need to do is kind of give a health check on what, was you, what did you do when you set up this industry? What have you done since? And how can I maybe go back and help clean it up in such a way where we can provide a proper auditing? And I don't mean it in the sense of like, um, you know, delete or uh, what I mean is, is like your structure is wrong. Let's reinvent it in a way that will allow the tax spending to be better for you. So what somebody might buy a piece of equipment, for instance, and they might have used the wrong account. They might have put it through a real estate company instead of through their operating company and so on and so forth. So what we try to do is, you know, go back and make sure that the money is accounted for and transacted in a way that is, you know, reviewable for an audit in the end. So from the tax side, if I can answer that a little more directly now, once you're operating, are, what is taxable to you? What is your spending? What is, um, what is going to be deductible is limited, and, and I'm sure you've heard already from others, the 280E tax, which is the one piece of tax that applies to cannabis companies that effectively says if you're trafficking in a Schedule One drug, you have to pay this tax and you have limited deductions. So what's trafficking? Is the selling a t-shirt part of that? Or can we maybe put that in a different bucket? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, just to use an example. So it's, uh, it's really digging in and, and trying to, again, get them healthy to go through the next steps. Yeah, you're really kind of like a coach where they, they come back to you and they say, all right, now, well, now what about this or what about yeah. that? And you kind of keep moving along and everyone's different and everyone's needs are a little different, but you get them moving to where they're supposed to be based on what they're trying to do. I think that's correct. And the way I look at it too is I'm a service provider amongst many and so what STEM did is it provided me a broader group. I have CPAs that we're partnered with, bookkeeping teams that we're partnered with, um, and the overall core of those service providers that will fill the pie of needs for this company. And so one of the things that I think I provide to my clients early on is I'm going to try to identify the things you're not recognizing you need and make sure you have that covered or at least have answered why you don't need it. Right. Right. You, know, you think you don't, but you do. <laughs> but, you, but you do. Right. And most of them will listen. <laughs> How much growth do you think is possible out there in the state oh, of Michigan? Man, it's, it's a monster of a market if we can get communities to sign up. I think the biggest limitation from my perspective is we have 140 some odd communities out of 1,700 that are participating, only 20 or 30 or so in uh, the recreational market. And, you know, that's a limited pie. You know, when you drive around, there's big gaps. So if you're living in some communities, you might have a two-hour drive to get to a store. Well, that doesn't make sense. We should be closer. We should have services available because, quite frankly, those patients in those communities that need these long drives are going to go back to the black market to support them versus going into stores where there'll be a diverse pool of product. I mean, look at that table over there that High Life has, there's 20 products on that right. table that a caregiver's not going to make for you out of their basement. And all of them will be better. <laughs> don't, you, don't you think that uh, some communities are just sort of sitting back and they'll say, okay, now we can look at this community. See, it, 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 it went okay for this community, so we can go ahead and do it now. Yeah. They just don't want to be first out of the gate. Yeah, I think the fear factor has driven a lot of it. And then some of the communities that opted in, even over the period of time since they've opted in, not a lot has happened. Right. Not because of anyone's fault, but just rather it takes time to build stuff out. And I think in the community next door, they're like, well, we'll just wait until that turns out and then maybe we'll consider ours. But then there's also some that still have the reefer madness concerns. And, you know, I try to remind them, you know, Ann Arbor's been a beautiful city for a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not apocalyptic <laughs> mess of zombies that are all high all the time, right. you know, and, and it's among student groups and I, it's fine. I, I feel kind of bad for some of the communities that need money really badly, yes. but they're holding back because they're worried that the marijuana might make things worse. Uh, but neighboring communities are, are getting in early and it's going to be hard to catch up. It's foolish. I mean, to be honest. Um, you know, first of all, we have companies that are spending money now. 